Thank you so much for that lovely inter introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. And I'm super disappointed not to be there in person this year. Um, the Ontario Summer Tour is really one of my favorite events of the year. And so I, I'm missing seeing you and getting to hang out with everyone. Glad that I can be here for the talk and hope this is helpful and informative. And uh, I'll just get right started because you guys have a busy day too. So um, each year when we tap a tree for sap collection, we know that a couple of different things are happening. So the tree's response to that tap hole wound is going to result in the formation of a zone of wood that is permanently non-conductive to either sap collection or water movement for the tree. And we also know that collecting sap is gonna be removing a portion of the tree's sugar or carbohydrate reserves. Um, however, on the other hand, we know that each year the tree is going to add new conductive sap woods to the tree uh, during annual radial growth. And of course, photosynthesis during the growing season should be replenishing some of those carbohydrate reserves. So when we try to find sustainability, sustainable or sustainability, it, it's, a, it's a difficult word to define uh, and often depends on the person making the definition or the context, of course. Um, so if we just kind of think of that very simplistic framework of the setup of maple production, as I just presented, one way that we can define sustainability is when the addition of new conductive wood to the tree outpaces the addition of non-conductive wood that we uh, generate through tapping. And also that the tap, uh, volume of conductive wood in the tapping zone remains really high over time. So sort of the opposite of the tree up here in the right-hand corner. So this provides sustainability or an element of sustainability from both a tree health and a sap, sap yield standpoint. So if we have a copious amounts of conductive clear sapwood in the tree, we know that the tree has a functional water transport system, a lower risk of disease and decay, um, but also we have a high probability of hitting clear conductive wood when we're tapping. So this, and the, over the long term. So this is also uh, representing sustainable sustainability from a yield standpoint. So with that framework, we can see that it's really radial growth rates that underlie the sustainability of tapping practices for both tree health and yield. So radial growth is really the, the great integrator of all things. So it's going to determine how much non-conductive how much conductive wood is being added. Um, and also radial growth rates, any stress that uh, affects the tree or any factor that affects the tree, whether it's crowding, an insect outbreak, a fabulous growing season, everything that affects the tree is ultimately going to be reflected in the radial growth rate. So it really tells us also a lot about what is going on with the tree. So what do we know about the impacts of tapping and sap collection on tree growth? Um, a few years ago, we, a few, uh, more than a dozen, let's say, uh, back in 2010, we started trying to find out, well, just what are the growth rates of the trees that we're tapping, at least in Vermont, with current sap collection practices? So higher levels of vacuum, uh, you know, uh, really good yield, things like that. So to do this, we collected increment cores from lots and lots of healthy trees that have been tapped with current sap collection practices for at least the previous five years, and then looked at the average growth rate in basilary increment for those trees over the previous five years. And just to kind of cut to the chase of the results, uh, what we found, what well, here are the average growth rates that we found for trees in different diameter classes in the study. Um, so what this graph tells us about the growth rates of trees tapped for sap collection uh, is not a whole lot without any context. So we can see that the basal area increment increases with tree size, which makes sense that basically just increases with tree size. But in terms of how these growth rates relate to sustainability, it, are the growth rates good enough for tapping to be sustainable? Um, we really, they, they don't tell us that without some additional context. So to provide some additional context and analysis, 
we use a model of the tapping zone that we developed that estimates the proportion of conductive wood in a tree over time, given various inputs of tapping practices like uh, tap depth and spout size and drop line length. So we use this to estimate what's the minimum growth rate necessary to maintain that relatively high amount of conductive wood in the tapping zone of a tree over time when we're using standard tapping practices. So we base this on a two inch tapping depth a 5 16th inch spout and a 30 inch drop line. And the minimum growth rates that we estimated are here in blue. And so what we could see once we estimated those growth rates was that the measured growth rates, which are there in orange, were generally above the minimum growth rates that we estimated were necessary. So this is a fairly reassuring outcome. Generally speaking, the growth rates of our trees that we measured that were tapped for sap production, sap collection and uh, sear production, those growth rates were higher than what we estimated the minimum needed to be. So cool. However, those averages represent the growth rates of over 800 trees. So that's a, that's a lot of trees going into just a few graph bars. So when we drill down and look at more of the data individually, we can see that those overall average mask some very important observations. And one of those is that there's just a tremendous amount of variability in the growth rates of trees. And that can be in the same stand or across different stands. So these are the trees at the 18 different stands or sites that we used in this, in this study and the six different size classes. So just kind of drilling down here and focusing on the 10 inch size class, you can see that from one site to another that there's actually a really pretty substantial difference in the growth rates of trees at different sites. Now that's not too surprising. Sites are very different from one another, but we also can see that there's a pretty decent standard error. So basically this is an indicator of the variation in the growth rates that make up the average within the same site. So there's lots of variation in the growth rates of individual trees. And you all know that just from working with the trees in your own forest. So that's not really a surprise. Um, so, but it is important to take into account when we're talking about this kind of analysis, because although the overall averages were um, greater than the minimums we estimated, when we looked at the growth rates of the 800 individual trees in the study, we discovered that between 27 and 41 percent of the individual trees had growth rates below those estimated minimums. So, you know, average good, but the individual trees, you know, there were quite a few that really didn't make the cut for sustainability. So what do we do about that? I will come back to that. So just kind of put a pin in this in your brains for the moment, and we'll come back to this as we circle back at the end and, and tie things together. Um, but so this was a, we were happy to do this study and it gave us some good information, but Anytime we try and use growth cores to look back in time over and just deduce the impacts of tapping on something, there is a lot that can go wrong with that. Let's just say that there's a lot of limitations in doing that. For example, that means that every single thing that happened to that tree, those two trees, your tapped tree and your untapped tree, as they go back in time, everything had to be exactly the same with those trees except that they were tapped or not. And when we're doing that with cores, it's very difficult to have controlled the whole past of that those two trees. Um, so really, if we want to get an answer of how does tapping and sap collection affect tree growth rate or do, do they affect growth rate, we really need to do a controlled experiment where we be begin with everything the same and then tap a certain set of those trees and a certain and leave a certain set untapped and follow them over time. So beginning in 2013, that's exactly what we did. We had all the trees in the same stand together. They were all healthy, all um, uh, co-dominant or dominant in the canopy. They had never been tapped before. 
and we split them up into three groups. So a third of them were left to be untapped controls and another third of them were set up to be tapped with sort of gravity sap collection methods. So uh, like hanging a bucket on a tree. And then the other third were set up to be tapped with high yield sap collection practices. So high levels of vacuum um, and well, basically high levels of vacuum. The, san good, the sanitation and all the other practices are equal between the gravity and vacuum sap collection. So we quantify how much is removed from each tree each year. And we also, uh, sort of more importantly to what we're talking about here today, we follow their diameter growth rate and health over time to see over time, it, are the growth rates of our tap trees any different from the growth rates of our control trees? And so far after a decade-ish of the study, um, essentially there is no difference in the growth rates of those trees. So on the, you have here the average diameter of the 33, 35-ish trees in each treatment group since the beginning, each year since the beginning of the study. So here's our controls, our gravity trees, and our vacuum trees. So you can see down here at the bottom, my screen is tiny, but hopefully your screen is big so you can see this. So all three treatment groups started off at four, with an average diameter of 14.1, 14.2 inches. And today, all of them are 15.2 inches on average. So broadly speaking, there is no difference to date in the growth rates of these trees. But obviously 10 years is just a drop in the bucket in terms of the longevity of tapping and sap collection. So the idea of course is to continue to follow these trees and see if any differences develop over time. If we look at the overall percentage of growth of these trees from beginning to now, we can see that uh, in terms of basal area, that our untapped and gravity trees have grown about 16 to 16.4%, and our vacuum trees have grown 14.6%. So again, there's no significant difference here. However, is this tiny numerical difference something that might become more biologically or statistically significant over time? And that's why we need to continue to follow those. But really, you can see that there's that the these are the this is the annual growth um, of the trees just over time as a line graph on average, and you can see that the trees their growth really mirror one another, and in fact they're so closely following each other that sometimes yes the untapped and gravity trees grow better. And sometimes the vacuum trees are the ones that are growing the, the most. So that really just shows that there is no difference because they're so, so very close to one another. Okay, so what's next? Well, one thing is that when we have, or when other groups have looked at, um, looked at the effects of tapping on sap collection in other studies, it is clear that if tapping is going to have an impact, it is likely on sites of less uh, lower quality. So soil fertility could be playing a role in determining if sap collection impacts radial growth. So for this and for a lot of other reasons, it's important to do the study that we're doing at the Proctor Center, not just on one site, but on multiple sites and of differing quality. So a few years after we started the first study at the Proctor Center, we expanded it in a way, um, although it's slightly different methods. Um, we began an expanded project at multiple sites, looking at doing, starting with never before tap stands and setting them up in treatments of tapped and untapped and monitoring their growth and health over time. So um, this began in, like I said, in 2017, the first year they were tapped is 2018. You can see here all the sites are along Vermont and a little bit of New York. Um, the trees are paired in this study. So there's 10 each of um, uh, tap and no tap in each diameter class. And we started with small diameters um, in part because that helps us, um, uh, we wanted data near the minimum tap, the, the minimum tapping uh, diameter um, because A, that gives us information and B, if tapping and sap collection is going to have an impact, um, the, there is a larger chance that we'll see it in a smaller tree. Um, so that's another reason to choose those small trees. But essentially, 
what uh, after five years of yeah of tapping and sap collection with these trees, we see no significant difference between the control trees and the tap trees across all the sites. So very similar to the results that we were seeing at the Proctor's Center study. Um, but of course, these need to be followed for a longer period of time to see if these no differences turn into a something difference. So, okay. Um, so we'll continue that study, um, hopefully funding and God willing uh, for additional years that we'll continue both of those studies and to see what happens and uh, the Proctor Center will, will continue to report those results. So now that we've talked about growth rates, uh, we started talking about tapping practices. So how do growth rates and our tapping practices and the tree and our yields, how do these all interact to get us long-term sustainable tapping for both yield and tree health. So the first thing that we can talk about is, you know, this is not rocket science. You know, you all know that I'm a pretty simple person. I like to think of things in simple ways. So the first thing is that tapping practices impact yield. And we all intuitively know most of what I'm about to say, but what's important is, or, or can be helpful, let's say, is actually putting some quantifiable numbers to these intuitive things like deeper tap holes make more sap. When we have a number that we can, or a quantification of how much more sap, it can help us make better database decisions about how to adjust our tapping depth based on the other factors that we have at play. Okay, so yes, the first tapping practice we know impacts yields is tapping depth. And based on a study done at the Proctor Center for three years, what we found was that yes, deeper tap holes do indeed result in greater yields, but only up to a point. So here these data are expressed as a percentage yield of a one and a half inch depth tap hole. So you can see that relative to the one and a half inch tap hole, a one inch tap hole produced 63% of the syrup yield that the one and a half inch did. So that is a fairly substantial loss or reduction in uh, what by going to that shallower hole. But increasing from one and a half inches, we can see that going to one and three quarters, to two to over two, there really was not much gain beyond the two inch mark. And actually there was really no gain beyond the two inch mark. So if there seemed to be a plateau in um, how much more sap we were getting for deeper tap hole depths. Okay, the second thing that we, the tapping practice that we know impacts yields is tap hole diameter. So similar story, yields increase with increasing tap hole diameter. And so we see about a 10% difference, for instance, between a 5 16 inch tap hole and a quarter inch tap hole. And this is of course with um, the same spout material, equal attention to leak checking, like everything the same, same level of vacuum, all that. Um, notably, this was almost identical what a to what a st study by Center Acer found with respect to tap hole diameter, about an 11% difference in the yield between a quarter inch and a 5 16 inch tap hole. All right, and uh, the other tapping practice that really has a chance or uh, an impact on yield is adding the second tap. So in one study that we've done, looking at the impact of adding the second tap on yields, we could found that the average increase from the, seven, uh, from the second tap was around 46 to 47% up to larger trees where things get a little bit hinky and you might think about adding a third tap and things like that. But in the trees of the appropriate size, the additional yield can be quite substantial. So this is, you know, again, a no brainer, but having some numbers to put behind it helps us visualize. And when we're trying to make decisions about what we wanna do in terms of tapping practices, we can have more informed uh, um, data to help make choices. Because, of course, we know that these tapping practices impact yields, but they also impact the amount of non-conductive wood. So we can't just have it all. We have to, everything that we're going to do is going to have to balance something. So deeper and larger tap holes, more taps for tree, 
more yields, but also more non-conductive wood. And this plays into sustainable and good sap yield and tree health over the long term. So we know that tapping practices uh, impact, you know, we're adding non-conductive wood when we tap the tree, but how much? And generally speaking, the volume of non-conductive wood added is proportional to the volume of the holes. So bigger holes and certainly more holes per tree are gonna be proportionally more non-conductive wood. So, well, I should say that differently. A bigger hole is going to make more wood. Two holes is going to make double the wood. So, you know, there's no question about it. Adding the second hole adds twice as much. On average, we see that the, the amount of non-conductive wood generated is about 50 times the volume of the hole, but this is super variable. And all the dissections that we do looking at this, we see a lot of variation. And uh, we just have a new paper that is gonna go in the next issue of Maple Digest that really tried to look at this and trying to look at what factor controls most the variation that we see in this. And we really don't see one factor that is driving it like growth rate or age or anything like that. Um, so there's a lot of mystery there, but you can see that the minimum in this study that we did, the minimum was 14 times the size of the hole. The maximum was 200 times the size of the hole. And those were all like the same size spout, same size hole. And all, all of them were, um, drilled into clear wood. So it wasn't like that 200, the one that was 200 times the size of the hole wasn't just one that like nicked another tap hole and then the, the uh, non-conductive wood exploded. That was just the response to an individual tap hole. So it's really variable. So it can be everything from something simple like this. So these are cookies that I've cut. Um, in, they're two inches wide, beginning in the center of the tap hole and going up and down. So you can see that this tap hole has been compartmentalized by four inches above and four inches below the tap hole. Very little non-conductive wood development. This tree is maybe more typical of what we see. So the top of the tap hole going up is along the top row here. This is the top. And this is from the bottom of the tap hole going down. So you can see that there's a lot of non-conductive wood. Uh, you know, it goes for a long way. And this is more typical. Um, and then I put this in, we analyze our data in cookies because it allows us to see more of the stain, but looking at the stains laterally, you can see that they don't always go straight up and down. There can be a lot of uh, variation in the orientation. It can follow the grain of the wood and kind of does, but not always. So it, that again is also um, somewhat not hard and there's no hard and fast rule about that. And so I kind of put this in here to show that like when you're looking at an old tap hole, trying to dis, you know, knowing where the clear, clear wood is going to be, the healthy uh, white wood is going to be relative to that tap hole is not always as like obvious as you would think because the stain could be going like this or like this or backwards and forwards. So uh, I always think that's good to point out. And then of course, when a tap hole is anywhere near an area of pre-existing non-conductive wood, the response to the new wound tends to interact with the response and the, the wound response to the existing wounds and make much more non-conductive wood as a result. Um, so this is just uh, an example of that uh, tree in which that has happened. So, the two of these factors come together because what this means and or how this functions together is that what we decide for our tapping practices actually influences the chances that we're going to hit non-conductive wood. So if we think about the tapping zone of the tree as the area that's accessible by the drop line of the tree, and this the, it's a if this works for bucket trees too, but the geometry is just a little different, but it's it basically the setup is similar. But basically, if we unfold the tapping zone of the tree, we can see that it is simply a three-dimensional rectangle that is defined in two and really three dimensions by practices that we choose. So the height of the drop line, or sorry, the height of the tapping zone is defined by the length of the drop line. 
the depth of the tapping zone is defined by how deep we choose to tap. And the width of it is determined by the circumference of the tree, which ultimately we do choose also. And so the three of these factors together, the total volume of that tapping zone is what determines the maximum potential amount of conductive wood available for tapping. So the size of the tapping zone determines how much we have to start to work with in the beginning. And lots of the, uh, at least two dimensions, if not three, are things that we decide as producers. And then of course, we're also determining how much non-conductive wood gets added each year by our choice of tapping practices in how big or how many holes we make. So the bigger the holes or the more we make, the more non-conductive wood we're adding to the tree each year. And if we put those two together, we can see, you know, again, looking at this very simplistically, the more non-conductive wood that accumulates in the tapping zone, the greater the chance of hitting it, hitting it when we tap. So as that accumulates, the more likely it is that we're going to encounter non-conductive wood when we tap. And this, oops, my advancer wasn't working. And what we can see with this setup again is that the radial growth, the diameter growth of the tree is the linchpin that underlies everything because it's going to determine how much new conductive wood is going to be added to the tapping zone as well as how much of the existing non-conductive wood grows out of the reach of our tapping bit. Um, so it is ultimately what's going to determine the proportion of conductive and non-conductive wood that's there and the chances of tapping into either. And fundamentally speaking, this all matters deeply in terms of yields, no pun intended, <laughs> because tapping into non-conductive wood, we know impacts yields. So again, we all intuitively know that if we drill into a tap hole and we hit some brown wood, that that tap hole is likely not going to produce as much sap. But my colleague, Mark Iselhart, a few years ago, decided to quantify just how much less. And I think we were all a little surprised at how significant the reduction was. He found that tap holes drilled into uh, stained wood um, yielded seven, on average 75% less sap than a tap hole drilled into clean wood. So as we increase our chances of hitting non-conductive wood, we have a greater chance, we have greater chances of significant reductions in yield. So this is how that all ties together. A um, couple of other factors to consider under the same umbrella. One of them is tree size. So we know again intuitively that bigger trees make more syrup or sap. We get more sap from bigger trees. Um, and that means that with small trees, we know that the yields aren't super high to begin with, but we also know that their relative size of tapping zone is much smaller than a larger tree, but we're gonna put the same size hole in it. So the relative proportion of, uh, the, of the tapping zone that each tap hole represents really increases with decreasing tree size. So non-conductive wood really accumulates a lot faster in small trees. And as well, we see that trees that are smaller in diameter in many of our stands, those trees are not in the main canopy. And so they're subdominant, they're not, they're not our, our, our canopy trees. And those trees also have much slower growth rates than their co-dominant and dominant neighbors. So that already enhanced accumulation of non-conductive wood in those small trees would potentially be further exacerbated by a slower radial growth rate. So small trees are really something to think about um, in terms of changing, changing perspectives about what to do with them. So in order to have ta uh, tapping practices that are gonna maximize yields for the long term, we really need to make sure that the tapping practices are gonna balance the current year yields, like the yield, the maximum yield that we can possibly obtain in a given year that will also give us a rate of non-conductive wood accumulation that will help maintain a high amount of conductive wood over time so that our future yields are also very good and uh, continue to be high. And you know, this all has to be balanced as a function of obviously the tree growth rate, its size, 
how much non-conductive wood is already there. And so you can really see here that growth rates are what enable practices that can result in greater sap yields sustainably over the long term. And so we kind of, instead of talking about tapping practices to maximize yields, we really should be talking, or it's helpful, I think, to frame it as optimizing yields over the long term. So how do we do this? At first and foremost, it is helpful to know something about how your trees are growing. And this is actually relatively simple to do. You can mark some locations on trees and measure them each year and see how they're growing. That's the simplest way to do it. Um, obviously, you can you know, use increment cores, but that's complex and requires lots of equipment. So I don't recommend that uh, outside of research. And the other thing that can be helpful is to simply estimate how often are you hitting non-conductive wood? Um, so if you are hitting non-conductive wood frequently, while that may not necessarily fairly indicate a lower growth rate, it can definitely indicate that it may be time to back off on some tapping practices to help uh, the tree accumulate some conductive wood so that you uh, tapping becomes, tapping into clear wood is more um, likely over time. So I want, in order to sort of optimize this, essentially it should be obvious and like you should have all gotten to this point already that really the tapping practices to promote maximum yields and sustainability begin with forest management. So any practices to promote the growth and health of our trees. Um, so that includes everything from thinning and other forest management to liming and soil amendments where they're needed and any other best practices to take care of the growth and health of the trees in your forest. So taking good care of soils and uh, taking good care of roads and taking good care of the remaining trees during logging and thinning, all of those really add up in terms of uh, maximizing the growth rates of your trees. And then in terms of actual tapping practices, like the very first thing that we can do uh, to help us ensure or have a higher likelihood of getting good yields by tapping into clear wood is by increasing the size of the tapping zone. There are things, any, the larger the tapping zone, the more potential conductive wood we have. So anything we do to increase that increases our chance of hitting clean wood without impacting our current year yield. So these are things like increasing the drop line length, moving the lateral line system vertically, and also of course tapping below the lateral line. So I promise we'd come back to that first study where we saw, you know, with these tapping practices, 27 to 40 percent of the trees had growth rates below the estimated minimums. Well, when we reran the estimates uh, using different tapping practices, just by expanding the length of the drop line by six inches, we decreased those number of trees that didn't make the cut from 27 to 40 percent to eight to 27 percent. So just by increasing the drop line length, uh, we reduced the number of trees that didn't have the growth rates necessary to maintain that high level of conductive wood over time. And similar speaking, uh, I, we, uh, blah, 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 I'm tongue tied, sorry. So tapping below the lateral, just briefly to say, I think a lot, most people have seen these results at this point, but tapping below the lateral when done appropriately with good vacuum, good sanitation, there is no difference in yield uh, tapping below the lateral versus above the lateral. So this is another really good way if you have vacuum and you know are really you know good sanitation practices. This is a really good way to help increase the size of the tapping zone and ultimately help get better yields. Um, and then, of course, if we really are not able to uh, have enough growth rate, you know, if we've done everything in the woods. We've done everything with our other tapping practices. Then if we need to, we can adjust our tapping practices that do impact current year, year, current year yields. So tapping depth, tapping diameter, and the number of taps per tree can all be adjusted to be reduced if we need to do that in order to maintain a high level of conductive wood over time. Okay, and I think, oh, it, just to add to the previous study, when we also re-ran the analyses with a longer drop line and a reduced tapping depth, 
the number of trees that didn't have sufficient growth rates uh, was reduced to between one and 11%. So uh, between expanding the size of the tapping zone and maybe making some adjustments with how much non-conductive wood we're adding, we can really make a difference in terms of long-term sustainability of high amounts of conductive wood. Okay, so we kind of already went through that, but basically the idea is you want to balance these two impacts over time because your tapping practices today are ultimately going to determine your yields of the future, not just your yields of the current year. And I feel like I have talked and talked and talked with, and I'm going to stop now uh, just to say that our new, uh, so we've incorporated a lot of these data into the tapping guidelines that are in the third edition of the North American Maple Producers Manual. So check those out if you want a more discussion about that or like putting some actual numbers to that. Um, and if we have time, if I haven't just talked way past my allotted slot, I would love if there were any questions. So everyone, I just, uh, you're here, here. I just say, can you speak loud just to make sure she can hear us over the microphone? Uh, you said an extra six inches for drop line length. What was that? Like a two foot to two foot six inches or? Could you, was that about drop line length? Yes, you said it was an extra six inches. Could yeah, you, we, so in the announce, the first analysis we used 30 inches, which was what used to be recommended. Um, and in the subsequent analysis, we used 36 inches. So, Nowadays, we recommend 36 inches for, you know, most size trees, but obviously bigger trees, we might recommend something more like 42 or above. Thank you. The oh. 47 to 41% uh, not sustainable, was that based on solely being above the lateral line? With the 30 inch line? Um, it was based, yes. So when you have a 36 inch drop line, uh, if you tap below the lateral, that would be a 72 inch drop line, essentially. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So, yes. Okay. So, essentially, just by tapping below the lateral, you can double your, your uh, area. Pro yeah, it's probably less than double so because you have to keep that J, or that little J in the drop line. So, maybe not quite double, but like theoretically double. Yeah, it's it's substantial. When you're looking at the uh, growth rate measurements, how do you how do you factor in uh, crown density and aspect? Does that come into the uh, you know somewhat scaling the the growth uh, measurements? Uh, well, to start off with, the uh, the trees and the growth rate studies are all like closely matched. Um, so they all have like co-dominant or dominant canopy. So they're all starting off with like similar crown area to begin with. We do take crown area measurements. Um, so like specifically size and length and all sorts of actual, you know, quality measurements too, like health indicators. So the way that any differences in those data or those variables are taken into account is that we have basically an average amount in each treatment group. So trees might have subtly different size crown, maximum crown widths between one and the other, but between the three treatment groups, they're equal. Does that make sense? I had a question about um, a poorly managed forest versus a well-managed forest in regards to your sap yield per tree versus your sap yield per acre. Is the per acre yield the same in a poorly managed forest versus a well-managed forest? It, it really depends on how many... <laughs> that, that, depends on a lot of different things. So, well, the one thing is that in a poorly managed forest, you're, and it, if I, well, 
Can you define what you mean by poorly managed? Because that could be a lot of different things. Yeah. So say uh, 120 trees, tappable trees per acre, which are kind of smaller, but still in your tappable size, fighting for sunlight, versus a thin forest, which has fewer trees per acre, but they're much healthier, right? So on a yeah. basis, what's producing more sap? So it's interesting. We've done a lot of work in this area. Generally speaking, like the year, as long as you, the a number of taps is adjusted, the it just the the yield typically is going to even out if you have more smaller trees than fewer big trees uh like it ultimately comes down to like the yield per basal area so if that uh forest with a lot of trees has actually kind of a similar basal area of tappable trees as the one with the lar fewer large trees, it will actually end up being about the same yield in the first couple of years. But then if that poorly managed forest is actually, you know, it has a lot of small trees that are tight together and not given room to grow, that's when the yields start to become different from the two different types of stands. The stand where you have a well, you know, good growth rates at, that are accumulating lots of new, clear, clean, clear wood each year, over time, those stands are likely to have better yields than one where you have very little thinning, very, the trees aren't giving any given any room to grow. Um, that's really kind of the point in trying to make in the the analysis here. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm I'm making so I'm I'm trying. Me and my colleagues are trying to slowly make a push to talk about not yield per tap, not yield per tree, not yield per area, but yield per basal area of conductive sapwood. <laughs> <laughs> So like any forester in the room is gonna be like, yes, yield per basal area, that makes sense. And the rest of yeah, everybody else might have to catch up a little bit, but I'm on a campaign. I'm starting, starting right now, yield per basal area. It is the the yield quantification of the future. It it makes everything comparing apples to apples. The growth rates uh, on your chart, there was a big dip where it basically had no growth rate, I think 2018 or something. You know yeah. It, that for us, 2018, I don't think I can go back, but 2018 and a couple years in there were just horribly, not horrible, that's terrible. Uh, they were very dry years, uh, very dry, very hot. Um, so we had a couple of years with really not a lot of growth at all. Um, and, and we've had seen a lot of mortality, um, over, over after those couple of years, like it, it was a rough couple of years for trees in that part of Vermont, for sure. And your trees are in Vermont, are they? Yes. So that those tree, the, the trees in the first study were all at the Proctor Center and the trees in the larger multi-site study are mostly in Vermont. And we have one site in ne Northern New York. I was wondering how, how you know, I'm, I'm up from near Sault Ste. Marie, if the trees would go slower there than where you are. Yeah, with different, you know, higher latitudes, like it, it is complicated because it would depend on like your elevation and your site. So, you know, you could be further north, but also have like be closer to sea level and have better growth rates than we do at the Proctor Center. And the site at the Proctor Center is like, this steep and the soil is about uh, a quarter inch thick. It's mostly rocks like, and it's got a very cold microclimate. So it's actually not a very, our site doesn't have very good growth rates um, necessarily. So really the, the growth rates depend a lot on lots of different factors about your site, not necessarily just your, you know, where you are on the map. Um, yeah, that can make a big difference and how you're managing your forest is the biggest one.
question, Abby, we talked a lot about the physical tapping practices, and my question probably deserves another hour presentation. We only have a minute. So can you speak a little bit about the other variable? And that's, as producers, we quite often ask ourselves, you know, as we increase vacuum levels, so as we take out twice as much sugar out of the same hole, you know, we know what that effect is in the media. What's the effect of the long, what's the effect of yield on yield? What's the effect of yield on the long term? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So, I mean, the one thing that is helpful about these studies is that by measuring growth rate, that is measuring the impact of taking out those carbohydrates on the tree. So, but your question about how removing carbohydrates impacts the allotment of carbohydrates in the future. Oh, let me just tell you, this area, the, uh, the area of carbohydrate dynamics in trees, like when trees allocate sugars to growth or reproduction or storage is like one of the most poorly understood complex issues in all of biology. Like, People write big philosophical papers about it and do lots of studies to figure out. And it is like still a giant unknown. So things that we assume like, you know, trees, uh, if they're something is stressed, it's gonna produce, make, put a lot of energy into seed because it's gonna want to reproduce before it dies. Things like that with trees, with perennial long lived plants are not simple and comp uh, they're not simple in year to year. The tree might take five years before you see the impact of a stress of like carbohydrate removal on how it allocates its carbohydrate resources. So the answer is, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll make this the last question, I think, just because of time. Maybe we can fit in a second one there. Uh, the tap the tap hole is one and a half inch, one and three quarter, two inch. How much greater yield is there for each of those quarter inch differences? None. So if I can go back to that really quickly, because that's really actual said, numbers. Two. I just was, didn't hear anything about greater than one and a half. Right. So everything above one and a half there was basically the same amount of gain, about a 25% gain from one and three quarter to two, two and a half, two, two and a quarter to two and a half was about that same 25% gain region. So you don't gain much, all things equal, um, at least in our studies over the three years, you, we didn't gain much by going really above two inches. Thank you. You're welcome. With apologies, I think we need to wrap it up. I've been told to make sure to give everyone time. Uh, Professor Vandenberg, the ratio of research findings presented to truly useful information was astounding. So I think, thank you. Uh, thank you. That's like the best compliment I could ever receive. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Have fun the rest of the day. I'll see you next year. Yeah. <laughs>